There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Killer Author Club, the first episode of 2024. We are so glad you guys are here. And we're so glad that we have Killer Angie Kim here, who's going to be with us talking all about our Good Morning America book club pick, Happiness Falls. We have tons to talk about. So grab your cocktail, your list of questions for Angie, and sit tight. We'll see you on the flip side. Thought you really loved me. Guess I was wrong. Thought you'd never leave me. Guess I was dumb. Waited like forever to be your plus one. But I guess you were done. And we're back. Hi, everybody. I'm Killer Kara Ruta, along with founding members Heather Gudenkopf and Kimberly Bell. And we're so excited to celebrate Angie's new book tonight in the clubhouse. The Killers and I started the Killer Author Club so that readers like you can interact with some of the best suspense and thriller authors in the business. Our winter spring lineup is fantastic, including Angie, and also Frida McFadden, B.A. Paris, Lisa Gardner, and so many more killer authors that you've got to tune in. Dates, times, and all information can be found on killerauthorclub.com. But tonight, we're here with Killer Angie Kim to talk about killing of the fictional kind, of course. So make sure to drop your questions in the comments, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. And if you're watching this on Facebook or have a Facebook account, check out our public group, Killer Author Club, or if you're a hardcore killer, our private members-only group called the Killer Author Clubhouse, where we pick a winner each episode, join for your chance to win swag. We also have a YouTube channel, almost up to 500,000, I'm really just 500 people, where we'll, <laughs> we'd love for you to join over there too. Okay, for links to everything, watch the comments or check out Killer Author Club website, killerauthorclub.com. So now, without further ado, Kimberly, would you please officially introduce our killer guest? I would be honored to. Angie Kim moved as a preteen from Seoul, South Korea to the suburbs of Baltimore. After graduating from Interlochen Arts Academy, she studied philosophy at Stanford University and attended Harvard Law School, where she was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. Her debut novel, Miracle Creek, won the Edgar Award and the ITW Thriller Award, was named one of the 100 Best Mysteries and Thrillers of All Time by Time. Happiness Falls, her second novel, was an instant New York Times bestseller and a book club pick for, for Good Morning America, Barnes & Noble, Bellatrist, and Book of the Month Club, and was named the number one novel of the year by Oprah Daly and one of the 10 best books of the year by People. She lives in Northern Virginia with her family. All right, Angie, so let's dive into the book. Could you give us like a quick little elevator pitch for Happiness Falls? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me, guys. I'm so excited to be here. And also just like a warning that I am coming to you from Northern Virginia where we are having a quite of a storm. So um, just in case like the power goes out or something in which case if, if it does and i will like quickly grab my phone and be right on so just <laughs> just a warning but anyway um uh happiness falls is a story about a family in crisis um it opens when the father of a biracial korean american family go goes missing and the only person who might know what happened is his 14 year old son eugene who has Angelman syndrome, a rare genetic condition, and cannot speak. So in order to figure out what happened to this beloved father and uh, husband, the family really has to come together and try to figure out how to truly connect with each other and most importantly, connect and communicate with Eugene. Loved it. And we're going to get a lot more into the story. And um, we have tons of questions for you in just a minute. Um, but first, let's settle in for the killer cocktail of this episode, Heather. Oh, yes. And this sounds so good. So it's the kimchi <laughs> martini inspired by Happiness Falls. So Angie, tell us um, about the inspiration for this cocktail. Why yeah, absolutely. So the kimchi mar martini is something that I discovered 
I think right after I got um, a vaccine for the for COVID. And um, I really wanted my like normal, you know, martini that I always have at like five or six o'clock every day. <laughs> and my mom was like, and I said something to my mom about like how I had just gotten this and um, I was going to make myself a martini. And she said, you know, but alcohol isn't good for you um, because it, you know, like immune system, blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, but you know what you should have instead is kimchi because kimchi is so good for your immune system. You need to boost it right now. And I was like, hmm, why don't I combine those two into one? So I made myself my standard vodka martini that I love. But instead of putting in like olives and olive brine, I put in a little bit of the kimchi juice and I put the kimchi, kimchi radish cubes and some kimchi cucumber onto my little, you know, thing and, um, and used it as the garnish for my martini. And I loved it. It's delicious. And I'm so, and I really wanted to show it off to you guys, but unfortunately because of the road closures and storm and blah, blah in Northern Virginia right now, I'm actually not at my house. I'm at a friend's house that I had to go to. So I'm unfortunately have a Prosecco in this glass instead of a kimchi martini. But I am assuring you that it is delicious and I highly recommend it. It so sounds delicious. Yeah, it it's does. so like, healthy for you. It's really good for you. A healthy martini. What could yes. be better? So yeah. you like invented this drink. Well, I don't think so. Like since then I have like Googled kimchi, various things like oh, okay. kimchi, martini, kimchi, whatever. And this is like a thing, like people definitely put kimchi in lots of different drinks. Um, but it is definitely something that I really like. And so I, I wouldn't go so far to presume to have invented it, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, cheers to that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Cheers. Yay. Congratulations to another amazing read. We love it. Mm, it really, it's amazing. Okay. And speaking of that, Happiness Falls is a New York Times bestseller. It's also a Good Morning America book club pick. Oprah's daily number one novel of the year and one of People Magazine's 10 best books of the year. There's so many praises. People said, this riveting missing person thriller is really a me meditation on happiness that illuminates the power of language and challenges readers' stereotypes. Love that. The New York Times said, a mystery that tugs at your heart. And then the Atlanta Journal-Constitution says, Angie Kim's powerhouse of a novel offers a probing explanation, exploration of the intersection of communication, speech, and intelligence that not only gives voice to the silenced population, but concludes with a fantastic twist. Wow, Angie, congratulations on all. It gives me the chills, like there's so much praise, I can't even read it all. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That's so nice of you. It's well deserved. Okay, but now for the very serious question. We need to know because we're the Killer Author Club. How do you kill? Yeah. I have been thinking about this like all day. I was telling these killer ladies beforehand. I was like, ah, oh, I don't know. Okay, but here's the thing. I've been thinking about it and I've only written two stories, but a lot of my short stories that I started with beforehand, before I went into novels, also, you know, feature people who have died. I think it's, it's fairly um, safe to say that I'm kind of obsessed with death and how, and people's guilt around how they may contribute to the death of people that they love. And the, all the deaths that I can think of in my stories come from my, um, my deep fears. So, you know, in Miracle Creek, which is my debut novel, there is, there are people who are killed, um, especially boys who are killed through a fire in what's supposed to be a medical experiment, um, you know, to that uh, a mother sort of puts her son through because she cares about him and loves him so much and wants him to get better. And it's an experiment that I, it's an experimental treatment that I actually did for one of my children with great success mm -hmm. um, for his ulcerative colitis, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But while I was doing it, 
I was like really worried. Like I had these nightmares that like something would happen to this chamber mm. that we were sealed inside and that he would, and I would be killed. And that this thing that I was doing for his benefit would ironically end up like harming us, you know, like, I think this is one of the things that a lot of, you know, parents, um, especially mothers, you know, have our fearful of. We do all these things to, for our children, thinking that we're trying to spare them or trying to like help their lives. But then what if it ends up harming them instead? So like the que the answer to the question, how do I kill is I think of like the awful things that happen inside my head mm -hmm. during my nightmares as I'm doing things for the people I love, thinking that like I'm going to these extraordinary lengths to like make their lives better. And then there's that tiny voice that goes like, what if it goes wrong? Mm -hmm. And they end up like horrifically disfigured or dead or you know like something like that happening and then i end up like working that out you know by putting it into my fiction which is probably something i should talk to a therapist about <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're right? in our author club we all should we all that, that. That, that's like I, th I think that's what i do i think that's how i work out my fears and yeah. you know so many of things and you know like even in this, there's a scene in, in Happiness Falls where um, some of the siblings are kind of like having fights and things. And I remember having my boys when we were on a family vacation, like somebody said something to the other teasing them and the other one didn't take it well because, you know, they were like 14 or something. And then they like, and they, and he pushed his brother, you know, like, because he was mad and then he ended up like being pushed into these hedges and we were like walking along and we didn't realize that there was like a hill beyond the hedge and so he ended up like falling and he didn't end up getting seriously hurt or anything but I remember like saying to them guys it's a good thing that we weren't at the Grand Canyon and we <laughs> aren't anyone I'm not taking you guys to the Grand Canyon until you're like 30 and you know you can control your impulses or something like those, some of the, the those nightmare scenarios I think that's how I kill my characters they're all sort of there in my nightmares and I use them to work out my fears don't you guys do that too yes yeah. yes then I think it's something that a lot of authors do you know yeah. especially authors in our genre because horrible awful things happen in these books and um, I think we're all trying to figure out, you know, trying to, trying to figure out, you know, what we would do, how we would, how we would handle it, what would happen. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you kind of, it's a little safer kinda, than real life to do it on right. paper. Because you have a little control mm -hmm. in your book, yeah. or you have no control in the real world. Right? You have yeah. all the control on paper, yeah. right? Yeah. That's I right. agree. So, Andy, I read I, this interview with you and it was talking, I think you said you wrote this Happiest Falls was based on a short story that you had written yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. So um, being a writer is actually my fifth career. Uh, wow. <laughs> I'm, and so I started as a lawyer and then I was a management consultant because I figured out that I hate being a lawyer. Um, and um, and then I was a dot-com entrepreneur and then I was a full-time stay-at-home mom. And then finally I discovered writing in my 40s. And I loved, like, I loved creative writing. I was like, where, where has this been my entire life? And it's funny because I'm not one of, I don't know about you guys, but I am not one of these people that started writing when I was five. Like, I never wanted to be a writer. I thought they were weird. I went to <laughs> you know, like an arts academy, which is this sporting school, and they actually have an amazing, amazing creative writing department but I didn't take a single class. I thought writers were so strange. I was an actor and I was like, why would you wanna sit in your room and write when you can like go on stage and act and sing and dance, you know? Um, so I, when I started writing, one of the first stories that I wrote was actually about this family um, the Parks and family, this biracial family with a stay-at-home dad and a Korean immigrant mom. And in this short family, they had gone back to Korea and their kids, um, Mia and John, 
who are fraternal twins, um, felt guilty about their five-year-old youngest, you know, um, brother Eugene, because um, they did something to their mom when she was pregnant with him, and it was just like a little prank. They were they weren't being, you know bad or anything but it was like a prank gone wrong and so they felt really responsible for Eugene being a non-speaker and not having a voice and having the diagnosis of autism when he was young and so they really felt like this prank the site of the prank which was this um graveyard in outside Seoul in Korea that his voice must be in the still in the grounds. So the story was called Buried Voice, and they went around with this antique stethoscope, looking like literally for their brother's voice in the ground, mm -hmm. and doing experiments to try to find it and try to reunite the voice with their brother. And so that was one of the first short stories that I wrote. And um, and it was published in a literary magazine, Sycamore Review, and it won a, uh, a short story contest judged by Charles Baxter, who is one of my idols. And when an idol like loves your story, and he had said in his judge's citation that he loved the voice, Mia's voice, and it was funny and all of that, I think it just like, you know, like when somebody you like really admire praises something that you write and it just kind of like makes you want to, mm -hmm. you know, like repeat that over and over again. So I think that voice, Mia's voice kind of stuck with me. And so whenever I would write something else, I would sort of think like, is there any role for Mia in this? You know, is there any role for this family in this? And then in my real life, when my kids were like applying to colleges, for example, I would be thinking to myself, like, I wonder how the twins in the story, Mia and John, like, I wonder if they're applying to colleges. Like, I wonder where they're applying and what kinds of essays they're writing and if they're applying to the same colleges. And so like they became real in my mind, even mm -hmm. though I mean, obviously I knew they weren't and they kind of grew up in my mind. And so when this story came along, and I learned about um, real life advances with non-speaking autistics and people with Angelman syndrome and things like that, who um, were learning to communicate, even though they couldn't speak, by learning to spell on letter boards, you know, letter by letter painstakingly. And I heard about that and then I connected with this community and I was so touched by them. I now teach um, creative writing to a bunch of these non-speaking um, people who are most of whom are autistic. Um, and I wanted to tell their story. It was so natural to me to sort of go back to this family that I knew so much about and like wonder to myself, like, I wonder if this family tried the same therapy with Eugene and I wonder what you know would have happened and so a lot of the story is about that. I love that and so how long ago did you write that short story so how long have they been in your head? So um, I started writing it 13 years ago and it was published 10 years ago yeah in well like 11 now 2013 so yeah I know right? So, so they were in your head when you wrote your first book. Yes, yes, they were definitely in my in my head. And in fact, when I wrote my first book, Miracle Creek, I actually had Mia and John, the older siblings. Um, Mia is the narrator in Happiness Falls. I had them. Um, they're not in Miracle Creek, but I actually did an experiment where I. Um, had them be the narrators um, mm -hmm. of the Miracle Creek story. So I have those and they just didn't work like her. She's very sarcastic and she's very know it all. And she's very 20. I mean, she's she's definitely a 20 year old kid. And I can say that as the mom of three boys, two of whom are 20 somethings in college right now and who are very, you know, like intense and all, like a very a lot right now um so she's like that and it just didn't work with the tone of miracle creek so i ended up telling that story directly from the seven 
POV characters who were like in, you know, most directly involved in the incident. Um, but I've tried to work them into like pretty much everything that I've been writing since then. And I'm so glad that I got that out of my system. <laughs> well, and, and speaking of Mia, um, I just loved her, but we really got to know her also through her footnotes, which I thought was such a creative, you know, fun way to, to add to the story. How did you come to include those side thoughts into the story that she yeah oh thank you so much heather um so i am i have kind of adhd tendencies myself and mia is definitely she's hyperlexic and she is also um she tells us that she was kind of like the you know the doctors like labeled her as asperger's when she was younger so she definitely has those types of tendencies herself and so she goes off on all tangents. And I had known that about her characteristic for like, you know, for 13 years, right? And so she makes me curious as a writer and, you know, as like a person. And I use this, the way that I write, I use a method that I call method writing, which is kind of similar to method acting from my theater background where I, you know, really try to inhabit the mindset of the POV character, whoever I'm writing from. Um, so, you know, for Miracle Creek, where I had seven characters, it was actually like, you know, fun because every three months or so when I would ch finish a chapter, I would just like change, you know, to a different persona. But with Mia, I was in her head for like three years. <laughs> so that was, that was a little harder. Um, but what was so interesting about her was that when I was in her head, one of her defining characteristics is that she is interested in everything. She's just very, you know, just intellectually curious. So I ended up going down these sidetracks with so many things. And in my free writing, I would go through all of these things and then I would do all these Google searches and I would write more about how they relate to what whatever was happening to her that day. And then I would be like, wait a minute, where was I? I don't even remember where I was in this story anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, clearly this is not gonna work. And so I took a lot of those things and then I decided instead of putting it into a parenthetical or whatever, I just like put it down into a uh, into the footnotes thinking that like that way people who are interested can read it and if you're not interested you can just like skip right over it like for example my husband does not like any of this stuff like he does not like these side points he just wants to get to like the point you know he's a lawyer and, uh, <laughs> and you know and he's kind of like what is with these footnotes and and so i was like you know what i am going to on page and this happens on page two i'm going to give readers like you like my husband whom i love dearly um a way to just bypass all that if you don't like that you can just skip it really there's nothing in there that like you need to know it's really like just more of a character you know breaking the fourth wall like being like hey audience members, like readers, let me talk to you. Like, let me, let's go into this a little more and let's get real. And so, and if you don't want that, you don't have to read it and you can skip it and not miss out on anything. And so I decided to put that in and I told my editor and my agent, I was like, look guys, this is something I'm trying. And my editor, he's like, you know, um, he's it, it's he's very into literary fiction whatever and he he and my agent both and so they were like oh yeah no but no it's in fiction or they're really nothing so it's great like if you want to do that yeah. that's fine especially since we're giving the readers a way out and in the audiobook we said if you don't like these footnotes you can just kind of zone out while we're doing the footnote and we'll like we'll say no and then we say like end the footnote you can pay attention now you know yeah no i loved it because i love learning when i read and it, it was i learned a lot actually um oh. and that's always fun so thank you yeah. Yeah. Fun. 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 
Yeah, I know. We are a time for <laughs> the giveaway of Happy Falls. Angie's giving away five copies. That's right. One, two, three, four, five <laughs> copies of Happiness Falls tonight to five lucky U.S. viewers. All you have to do is enter to enter is answer this question about our guest and we'll choose Five winners from all the correct answers, bonus points for joining the Killer Author Clubhouse on Facebook or subscribing to our YouTube channel. And it helps if you shout out where you're from. Um, the question is, what country did Angie and her family move from when she was a preteen? And if you don't remember, you can go back and replay the video, but wait, because we've got lots <laughs> coming up. <laughs> That's right. And the killers, we love independent booksellers and we want to support them any way that we can. So that's why we've partnered with bookshop.org and we have our very own Killer Author Club store on their website where you can find all our books and all our guest books, past, present and future. So make sure you check that out. We also have some fun listicles there too. So uh, make sure you take some time and run on over there. We'll be dropping that link in the comments. But in the meantime, speaking of indies, uh, we have a very special indie to, to share from Angie, and it is called Scrawl in Reston, Virginia. So Angie, tell us why Scrawl is so important to you. Yeah. So, I mean, there are so many indie bookstores in the DC area that I love and that I moderate like, you know, events for a lot. Um, there's Politics and Prose, there's East City, there's Loyalty. Um, there's Bard's Alley in Northern Virginia, but I chose um, Scrawl for you guys to highlight because Scrawl is a tiny indie bookstore in Reston, Virginia, and they're the closest indie store to me. And also something I love about them is they deliver to my neighborhood and to all of the Northern Virginia areas around yes, them. Awesome. So you can, I know it's so cute. They have this like cute little, I think it's like an electric car that they drive around. And so like you can, yeah, so don't you love that? So you can yeah. just like, or you can order from them and then they'll like, they'll just deliver to you. Like, you know, the next time they're in the neighborhood sometime in the next like couple of days. And um, I remember during COVID, they brought my paperback release was during COVID. It was in April of 2020 for Miracle Creek. And so they just brought books to me, to my driveway and, you know, masked and all that. And, you know, and then they like texted me and then I came out and I signed and personalized books for them, for their their customers for my paperback. And then they like drove it back. And I remember seeing that and it was just so cute. And I, I love them. Um, so even tonight, I'm, uh, I was at this book club earlier tonight, which is the, the book club host is where I am actually, um, her office is where I am right now. And so I love supporting them and I love supporting um, them to the point where like, I actually, they gave me their iPad with their square. Um, and I brought it to the book club for people who wanted to buy extra copies, you know, as gifts and things like that for me to personalize and things. And so I'm acting as their guest bookseller tonight. So oh, I, feel like this, I feel like this is so great in so many ways. And also for authors out there who are listening to this, I think this is an awesome thing. I haven't really done this, but um, to actually bring extra copies of your books for people to buy, like on and to coordinating with a local bookseller to do that, mm -hmm. um, because that helps them, that helps you, it makes everybody feel good. It's just a wonderful thing all around. Love it. I love well, that so idea. Like great, great indie. Um, and hopefully we can get to the the Virginia area and visit. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. All right. So uh, our next segment. Does it have to be, okay, wait. There I go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Woo. Okay. So we cannot have everybody who would like to be on the show on, unfortunately. But 
we would like to celebrate two exciting releases that are out right now. Death Under a Little Sky by Stieg Abel is out today. And this widely praised debut crime thriller, a high-flying detective leaves London for a fresh start in the countryside, only to find himself on familiar ground hunting for a dangerous killer. Lee Child said it was tense, but patient, fast, but thoughtful, twisty, but substantial. That's fun. Okay, I like that. Um, also, we have Deep Freeze by Michael Grumley out today. And Deep Freeze, we have two copies to give away, which is exciting. So if you'd like to read Deep Freeze, please put a comment in the, in the comments. Um, Deep Freeze is a lone traveler and army vet. John Rife plunges to his icy death in a bus accident, but John is returned to life in a medical lab surrounded by scientists who are surprised that the technology worked and wary of telling him that he's been frozen for 20 years. Burr. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's Deep Freeze. And like I said, we have two copies of that for you guys. So drop a comment if you'd like to read it. Sounds great. And um, as you guys know, membership has its privileges. Every episode, we choose a name from the Killer Author Clubhouse hat. That's our private group. To win a piece of a swag, we've got T-shirts, mugs, candles, totes, hats, you name it, we got it. All of which can be found at KillerAuthorClub.com. And tonight's winner is Mickey Munoz. Please send one of the killers your address and we will send some killer swag your way. All right. And we have reached that point in the show where we have to tell you, Angie, that you have survived the killer off. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Woo! Yay! I love this so, so much. This is so amazing. <laughs> We would like to bestow upon you this lovely badge. We can, uh, we'll send it to you too, where you can print it out and put it on uh, your wall with all your other literary awards. Uh, <laughs> those. But thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, it's it's been so much fun. So congratulations on surviving. Oh, thank you. I'm really. Ha I'm just actually so happy that like. We survived this whole storm without the, the electricity going out and the Wi-Fi cutting out. So I'm calling this a win in so many different ways. You have no idea. <laughs> we completely agree. We were we were wondering what we were going to do had you not been able to log on. I know. <laughs> you saved us too. So we survived because of you. We like that. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Yes. Awesome. That does it for tonight's episode. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. And thank you again, Angie, for being here. We will Yay. see you guys right back here on January 23rd with the one and only Frida McFadden. She'll be joining us here in the Killer Author Club at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific to talk about her new book, The Teacher. So don't miss it. For times, full schedule, and past episodes, recipes, merch, all the good stuff, go to killerauthorclub.com. And happy 2024, and we'll see you next time. Aww. Bye. I guess I'm a killer through our love